support for I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere comes from MX Publishing, with the largest catalog of new Sherlock Holmes books in the world. New novels, biographies, graphic novels, and short story collections about Sherlock Holmes. Find them at mxpublishing.com. And by the Wessex Press, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wessexpress.com. And from listeners like you, who support us through Patreon. Bonus material, thank you gifts, and more await at patreon.com slash I Hear of Sherlock. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, episode 240, Anticipations in a Sherlock Holmes Commentary. I hear of Sherlock everywhere since you became a strong man. In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. You're Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jack in office. <laughs> The game's afoot as we discuss goings-on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the bigger street irregulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Ah, ha, ha, welcome once again to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And Bert, have you been anticipating this show? I have been. I, you know, in fact, my hands are raw from rubbing them together. <laughs> <laughs> With glee and anticipation. With, yes, exactly right. I love it. Anticipation. Yeah. Well, anticipation is making you wait, uh, but just through this uh, how, bit of housekeeping that we have for you, reminding you that the show notes for this episode, and there will be many links, by the way, so make sure you check out the show notes for this episode at ihose.co slash ihose240. All lowercase. That'll take you directly to the I Hear of Sherlock.com website to this particular episode where we'll have all sorts of goodies for you there. Um, you can also uh, leave us a comment there if you wish. And of course, you can always leave us a comment by emailing us at comment at I Hear of Sherlock.com. And don't forget, we have a call in line as well if you would like to be among those who participate in. Uh, the audio elements of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. We certainly wouldn't uh, dissuade you from that. You can give us a call. Our number is 518-952-2125. That's 5-1895-221-B-5. How about that number? Put it to good use and see what comes out on the other end. We'll be just as surprised as <laughs> you. And of course, I should not... Uh, miss the opportunity to mention that we have a number of Patreon supporters, people who so believe in what we're doing here that they contribute to the show. Um, could be a dollar a month, could be $3 a month, $5 a month, whatever works for you and your budget. And we do have some wonderful thank you gifts for people at various levels. So take a look at patreon.com slash I hear of Sherlock, or you can get to it from the show notes on our website. Thank you very much. And now we're off to talk to Bruce Harris on anticipations in D. Martin Dakin's A Sherlock Holmes Commentary. Bruce Harris picked up a Signet Classic paperback copy of The Adventure of the Speckled Band and other stories of Sherlock Holmes and read the title story. The year was 1965. And after that, he was never the same. It spawned a lifelong fascination with the world's first consulting detective. Bruce is the author of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, About Type, from the battered silicone dispatch box in 2006. And his articles have appeared in the Baker Street Journal, the Sherlock Holmes Journal, the Watsonian, and Canadian Holmes. 
He's also contributed Holmesian essays to Mystery Weekly Magazine's special annual Sherlock Holmes issues, as well as the Sherlock Holmes magazine. He's a charter member in the John H. Watson Society, and he lives in Irene Adler's birth state. Bruce Harris, welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Thank you, Scott. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to be with uh, you and Bert. Excellent. Well, I feel like it's almost overkill to ask you how you first met Sherlock Holmes, but I want you to expand on what we just heard from your bio. Tell, tell us a little bit more about how you came upon that book and, and the impressions that it had on you. Sure. Um, I, still rem- I still have the book, by the way, the little paperback. Um, and I remember sitting in my backyard in, uh, on Long Island in New York, and I was never a reader as, uh, as a kid. Uh, baseball was my thing, and um, actually still is, but I really was a poor reader, didn't like to read. Um, I don't remember where I got that book, but um, I sat in the backyard one summer uh, afternoon, read The Speckled Band, and just like my eyes opened wide, and I thought, how oh, this is great. What a terrific story. And um, worked my way through the rest of the stories in that little paperback. And um, probably for the first time, uh, sought out a book that I bought myself. And it was uh, The Complete Sherlock Holmes with the uh, Christopher Morley um, intro. And um, I just devoured each and every story. That's lovely. That's a, a, a lovely introduction. And, and you know, it, it's marvelous when we hear that these short stories have become gateways for many people uh, to uh, enter the world of literature. You know, they, it's, it, this isn't difficult reading, which is uh, part of the, the wonder here. You know, Conan Doyle wrote for uh, essentially for children as well as for adults when he created this. It, it's uh, uh, uniquely accessible. And how wonderful that uh, this provided you a window into a world that, uh, well, had either been closed for you or that you had, uh, you had kept closed yourself. Uh, yes. And, and in fact, it was, you know, I, I mentioned the baseball, and I played a lot of baseball growing up um, to settle my settle my nerves in the field, I would often think about the, the stories just to like keep my mind off the pressure and it, it relaxed me. Oh, that's wonderful. And what, and Bruce, what was your path then from, um, the, the stories in the, you know, reading, reading through the entire canon to, um, some of the writings about the writings of which, you know, we've got, Dakin's Sherlock Holmes commentary is sort of a huge example here. What, uh, right. Was there any, what, what, what did you, what did you then sort of pick up that got you on that way? Um, I guess uh, my background I've had, um, when I went to college, um, I wound up getting, uh, this is years ago, uh, a PhD in social psychology. And that's basically a research degree. Um, so, I always enjoyed the research uh, aspect of it and um, never really enjoyed the statistical analysis uh, part of the research. So I remember once reading uh, years ago uh, a Baker Street Journal article that um, utilized chi-square analyses in it, and I remember writing the author, I forgot his name now, but um, I said, you know, I usually read the Baker Street Journal to get away from statistics, uh, and you brought me right back into it. So um, it, it's really just based on on how I enjoy doing the research, and um, and this is like research without statistics, as far as I'm concerned, uh, for the most part. And um, that's how I, I just got interested. Um, I, I will say also. I had come across, after reading all the stories, I had come across some um, issues of the Baker Street Journal, 
Oh, you know, it was back in um, when I was going to school and my um, girlfriend at the time, who is now my wife, uh, lived in Little Rock, Arkansas. And one summer uh, I spent in Little Rock and got up with um, uh, Jason Ruby. I forgot the name of the scion there. Uh, he was a BSI member. Uh, he introduced me to the Baker Street Journal, and um, you know I was like flipping out with all this good stuff in there. Um, then I start. I, in fact, I, I remember thinking that Ben Abramson's shop might still be in existence in New York from the old uh, journal issues, but uh, you know I soon realized that it was long gone, and um, you know then I became a subscriber and have been one ever since. Well, that's a that's a lovely path. Um, I, I I don't know uh, if it's typical or atypical. I mean, we all come to uh, Sherlock Holmes in our own way, but uh, it certainly sounds poetic. And um, and and Bruce, I too share your horror of Chi Square. So we will uh, steer clear of that, so to speak. Now, I I just have to ask. I can't be the only listener here that doesn't know what is Chi Square analysis. It, um, it's a statistical uh, analysis basically to, um, for like yes or no, um, one or two analyses. So it, is, it tests for significant differences if uh, there are basically two variables. You know, um, do, do more people, um, what, whatever, and today, you know, more people favor abortion or not. So if you had a group of a thousand people and they voted uh, or put down yes or no, you could do a chi-square analysis to see if that difference is significantly different. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm, that's a great explanation. That's a, I was thinking it had something to do with Kai Lung. <laughs> and, but that would take me to Ernest Brahma, and that's the well. You know, uh, Bert. In in my graduate school days, I was actually thinking of opening a tea shop in in a little area of the campus and calling it Chai Square. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry, that's my well, only. You'd, you'd need a cardamom to get in there. <laughs> All right, that's it for the statistical tea jokes right now. So, uh, but Bruce, let's turn to the inspiration for your book. The book that we're here to discuss is Anticipations in D. Martin Dakin's A Sherlock Holmes Commentary. And that brings us back to Dakin. Now, for folks who aren't familiar with this work, um, this is uh, a, a, a book that came out in the early 1970s where Dakin explores... Um, elements in the canon, things that uh, he wanted more information on, things that he was positing. And uh, what's really interesting, I want to read a little bit of the foreword and then turn it over to you for your reaction, Bruce. Uh, Dakin writes, uh, I submit for the consideration of students of Sherlock Holmes my observations on a number of major and minor problems occurring in the sacred canon on which I felt I had something new to put forward, or which, to the best of my belief, have not been dealt with, or entirely dealt with, by previous critics. I say this with all the necessary reservations. I have not read all of the commentaries, especially those from across the Atlantic, and cannot guarantee to remember all that I have read. In fact, while I've been rereading some of the classics, including past issues of the Sherlock Holmes journal, I found, to my mortification, that in several instances where I thought I was being original, I had been anticipated by other scholars. As Holmes himself once remarked, it's all been done before and will be again. Doubtless the pages of the corresponding U.S. publication, the Baker Street Journal, would reveal other anticipations. For all my shortcomings in this respect, I hereby make full apology, while at the same time acknowledging my indebtedness to innumerable Holmesian scholars and fellow members of the Sherlock Holmes Society. So, Bruce, it sounds like there was a little bit of inspiration in that forward as far as you're concerned. Uh, exactly. Exactly, Scott. So that, that piqued my interest. Um, the Dakin book... Um, you know, it's just a staple for pretty much any Sherlockian research, along with uh, Les Klinger's 
the, the reference library um, and the uh, Jack Tracy's encyclopedia, for example. So anytime I, you know, I'm engaged in research, uh, the Dakin book is, is open and I'm looking at it. Um, so, you know, it not only delves into every story, but it's also one of the, I guess, finest chronologies out there. Um, so he really um, did a masterful job. And I took the challenge of what he said in that forward. I thought he, you know, if he was still around, he would appreciate it because he, um, he himself got into a little, um, I don't know how to put it, but literary spat in the pages of the Sherlock Holmes journal with, um, with Trevor Hall after Trevor Hall published his 10 literary studies in uh, 1970, that uh, Trevor Hall had um, basically uh, would ask people to, you know, criticize the work or what they found, what they weren't happy with. And uh, Dakin did that within the pages of the Sherlock Holmes journal. And it turned out Trevor Hall wasn't too happy about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I guess be careful what you ask for. So um, it's, I sort of took Dakin's words as, you know, a challenge that, hey, you know, there is stuff I missed. There is stuff I had forgotten about. Um, and he was, of course, in England. So I'm not sure how much access he had to the Baker Street Journal. So, you know, there were more items, much more items I found in the Baker Street Journal that uh, he touched upon uh, versus the Sherlock Holmes journal. So I mean, this is interesting, Bruce. So uh, when you take a project on like this, I mean, there's a lot of material out there across the canon, obviously. Did you look at this through a 1972 lens in terms of the the publications that would have been around in Dakin's time that he missed? Or did you take kind of take this as uh, more of a macro assignment through present day? Yeah, no, I, I did it basically the former. Um, I, I just limited it to the Sherlock Holmes Journal and the Baker Street Journal um, for uh, two reasons. One, you know, those are the two journals he specifically mentioned in the forward. Um, and two, if I were to have gone outside those two and looked at everything else, I'd probably still be researching it which is not the worst thing in the world, I guess. But um, so I, I just wanted to limit it to that. Um, the other advantage I had was using um, uh, DeWall's uh, big bibliography, the first one um, that was published, I think, in 74, maybe. Um, you know, looking through that for articles for BSJ and SHJ articles um, that were published up, un you know, up until 1972 when Dakin's book came out. So, you know, the research was sort of finite. I had guidelines there. Um, and I'm, you know, I, frankly, I'm sure I missed things um, that, you know, hopefully others will find, um, not only in these two journals, but like I said, I didn't explore other other avenues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So just for our listeners uh, who may not be familiar, um, Ron Burt DeWall, um, Bruce just mentioned DeWall there, in the early 70s wrote uh, the definitive uh, bibliography, the, the world bibliography of Sherlock Holmes. And, you know, this is one of those things that it's, it's a never-ending project. So, I mean, you have to take snapshots at particular periods in time and it's actually quite fortunate that that publication is around or still accessible because uh, in terms of your project Bruce I mean it's almost a time capsule of sorts that allowed you to focus on you know those those pre-early 1970s publications exactly so um, yeah it wasn't so overwhelming as it might have you know might seem 
Yeah. So, so where do you start? You know, when when you're when you're going through this. I mean, Dakin has a uh, you know a, a process where he goes through. Well, he lists all of the stories in their publication order, and of course, he assigns chronologies to them. But what what was your approach? How did you first begin digging into this? Well, like any uh, other Sherlock Holmes research, it, there's always the fear that you know, like you mentioned before, it's been done before. Um, you know, as as many uh, of the new articles that come out, it's always incredible, and it's always a little scary when you start something that uh, it's been done before. So, uh, you know, I first checked around; I hadn't seen anything like this. Um, I love these classic, you know, I call it a reference book. Um, and um, I just started going through DeWall first, you know, by the cases, and then uh, how to expand to other areas in DeWall. Uh, because, you know, if you look at DeWall, um, some of the cases, especially in that first 74 volume, only have one or two entries in them under you know the specific case titles so um you know at first i was thinking there's not much here but then i realized oh you know there's so much under like whatever the topic was characters whether it would be holmes or watson or uh moriarty or uh mycroft you know i had to really go through the wall pretty thoroughly um to search out any bsj or shj article and um, and and you know I reread Dakin several times over, um, and my copy is uh, <laughs> pretty beaten up. <laughs> well, it's it's fabulous. You know, how long did this take you? Um, it took me about six months, I guess, to put together. What a lot of fun! That's actually not that bad when you think about it overall. <laughs> no, um, no, it's not. I'm, you know, fortunately I'm retired now, so I, I have time to do it. Um, and, uh, you know, once I started it, I really uh, just kept at it. Well, you know, the lovely, the lovely thing, thing about, about it, it is, uh, particularly for our listeners, that Dakin's book, A Sherlock Holmes Commentary, which, as we've mentioned, was published in the early 1970s, is still widely available in lots of editions for very relatively little money on ABE books and other places. And that, coupled with your book, which is available, uh, I know, on Amazon and you know through other sources here, Anticipations in D. Martin Dakin's Sherlock Holmes Commentary, your book, um, coupled with the Dakin book, really makes... Um, a, the Dakin book, you know, more val even more valuable and relevant, but it also allows you to have this sense of temporal development. You know, what happened since the 1970s um, in articles referring to things that Dakin touched on. But also, you know, one of the key points here is your title, Anticipations, in D. Martin Dakin's Sherlock Holmes Commentary. So as you got into this, did you, what did you find? Did you, did you find anything surprising in terms of people who um, were ahead of Dakin in some areas or on some points? Um, yeah, uh, I did. The, um, if I can make one correction, uh, Bert, I, I don't believe it is available on Amazon. Oh, sorry. sorry. No, that's all right. Um, I do have copies myself, and, um, and the publisher, George Vandenberg, has copies. But um, there were some surprising uh, findings. Um, it was all, some of the things were almost word for word, which kind of surprised me. In the engineer's thumb, uh, Dakin talks about Iford, that the town does not exist. Um, and then in uh, a Baker Street Journal article in 1969, where is Iford? It, it, there were a lot of things. Um, like that, I'm just trying to, that it just surprised me that Dakin didn't, um, didn't note them, you know, for his, in the chronology piece of his book, which was like the first section of each story, he spoke about the quote, the date, they were pretty heavily footnoted, uh, if you will. 
but his observations were not. In the Crooked Man, under his title, David's Sin, uh, Dakin writes uh, that despite the Niles, Holmes' knowledge of King David's affair with Bathsheba is proof of the detective's familiarity with religion. And then way back in uh, 1948, Edgar Rosenberger in the Baker Street Journal um, you know, specifically mentions uh, the affair uh, with Bathsheba. And Holmes states, my biblical knowledge is a trifle rusty, I fear, but you will find the story in the first or second of Samuel. So there mm. were, that's the sort of thing that, um, you know, just surprising that it wasn't referenced. And in, in many cases, there were more than one reference that uh, Dakin either missed or had forgotten about. Mm. But we'll continue this conversation with Bruce Harris on Antishop. On, wow, I can't even say that. <laughs> Anticipations in D. Martin Dakin's A Sherlock Holmes Commentary right after this quick word. MX Publishing recently launched the MX Audio Collection, an app with a series of interviews and other audio content, beginning with Lee Child talking about Reacher and Sherlock. There are many more interviews lined up for 2022, including Jeffrey Hatcher, screenwriter for Mr. Holmes, Otto Penzler, the founder of the Mysterious Bookshop and Mysterious Press, authors like Bonnie McBird and Nicholas Meyer, and yours truly, Scott Monty and Burt Walder from I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Every month, MX will be adding in at least four new Sherlock Holmes stories and some more theater performances. There'll be more from the deductionist, Ben Cardall, too. You can read more about the app and sign up for the MX Audio Collection at ihose.co slash mxaudio. That's all lowercase, ihose.co slash mxaudio. There's a monthly subscription option and an annual subscription option with a significant discount. And iHose listeners get an additional 25% off of any subscription you choose just by using the code IHOSE when checking out. A percentage of the proceeds of the app go to Undershaw, the school for children with learning disabilities. It was the former home of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who of course wrote many of the Sherlock Holmes stories while he lived there. So go to IHOSE.co slash MXAudio and use the code IHOSE today for the MX Audio Collection. Okay, we are back talking with Bruce Harris about his wonderful companion volume to Martin Dakin's A Sherlock Holmes Commentary. Uh, Bert, I'm going to let you pick up the Q&A. Well, you know, it's wonderful that what you get here because this is, you know, occasionally in, in our conversations with authors and Sherlockians, we find people who've done something, you know, really new. And of course, as we know and as our listeners know, the writings about the writings, you know, certainly go back to, let's say, you know, 1900, you know, the era of Sir, uh, the era of Father Ronald Knox, but perhaps even earlier, you know, where people were writing about the Sherlock Holmes stories. And we know that goes back actually to the 1890s. But this book, Anticipations in D. Martin Dakin's Sherlock Holmes Commentary, is writing about the writing about the writings. <laughs> And, and what you have, you know, is um, not only an interesting amplification of the points and, and additions to the points that Dakin makes in his book, but you can also use this as a way of starting your own thinking about, um, you know, future papers to write or points that you might think don't make much sense and maybe you want to dig into them on your own. And the lovely thing about it is that, you know, it, it harkens back to a time when we didn't have tools like the B EBSJ, which you can search and, and easily comb through, you know, a big chunk of the publication history of these journals and the electronic Sherlock Holmes journal and find these kinds of, these kinds of references. But, but my question, you know, so that's just sort of an observation, but my question was, so Bruce, um, did you? What was your feeling about Dakin when you finished? Was it the same as as 
when you started? I mean, did you get any insights into into um, him and his work? Um, I, I, well, I've always been impressed with the book. Um, and I, I just want to mention, uh, before I forget, in the spring 2016 issue of the Baker Street Journal, uh, Nick Utekin has a great article uh, entitled D. Martin Dakin, an Underrated Scholar. Um, again, spring of 2016, and he, uh, he talks about the book there. Um, it just, I guess, a greater appreciation uh, for his thought processes because, again, I'm sure he hadn't even seen a lot of these Baker Street Journal issues. Um, who knows if he had a complete issue of the Sherlock Holmes Journal. And, um, you know, the, the quote, great minds think alike that, you know, his some of his thoughts were that he put on paper, you know, others had thought about as well. Um, and he may or may not have put a different slant on it. But, um, you know, he, each story doesn't, like if you just look at it, you know, the, the pages doesn't look like much, but when you read what's in there, it, it's a great depth of, of knowledge and insight into each of the short stories that, that he's got. So I came away more impressed with the book than when I, when I began. Hmm. That that is a wonderful uh, ringing endorsement. You know, uh, the Dakin book has graced my shelves for a number of years, and I, it, it's interesting because I typically turn to my Bearing Gold. I turn to uh, Good Old Index. You know, some of the other more easily accessible annotated type things, uh, and and Dakin here has really it's it's a wonderful reminder that he's really produced uh, a book that's worthy of spending time with because it's uh, it, it's not only you know a chronology it not only asks some of these questions but it really well I guess the title is a spoiler alert it, it it's really a wonderful commentary on on the books uh, right it's um, I agree it's uh, it, it's it's just an incredible addition to any, you know, any Sherlockian's library. Um, like Bert said, it's it's been around, it's available. Um, you know, it, it's not that expensive. And and even um, I think it was on a, an episode of Trifles where you, you both discussed the casebook um, stories from uh, Dakin's Sherlock Holmes commentary, and his feelings on whether those stories were legitimate or illegitimate. Yeah, that's right. It, it, it provided uh, wonderful fodder for us for that, uh, that discussion. Um, so, Bruce, uh, Bert asked you before about any surprises uh, that you found in your, in your research. I'm going to approach this kind of from the opposite uh, aspect. In terms of any things that seemed blatantly obvious to you, are there major oversights that uh, Dakin made that in turn surprised you? Again, just the dearth of footnoting in the, you know, in the commentary portion of the stories. Just seemed like he did a much more thorough job uh, for the dating on the chronology piece of it versus the, uh, you know, his, the story commentary. Um, you know, that was it. There's another, like from the Noble Bachelor, he, he speaks about um, Holmes's quote, worldwide country, where a combined England and the United States. And then, um, you know, I found J.N. Williamson in the Sherlock Holmes Journal in 1956 had spoken about the same thing. Um, one of Sherlock Holmes's most famous uh, speeches, you know, quartering of the Union Jack with the Stars and Stripes. So um, just, you know, I don't know if he just pure coincidence that he didn't see it, um, just neglected to footnote a lot of this stuff. Um, but it just seemed odd that the the dating part was just more thoroughly uh, footnoted than the commentary piece. 
Well, you know, that happens sometimes with chronologists and chronologies. People become very wrapped up in um, the rationale, the details, the supporting information, the other things to consider when you come on to a date. Well, there, there are many lovely things in, in your book here, and as we've been saying, it does make, combined with the Sherlock Holmes commentary, a really terrific contribution to Sherlockian scholarship. Um, but one of the things that I really like that you have in this book is on page 85, you know, you point out that when you think about this question of anticipations, 14 of the 60 cases there are no anticipations for any of these stories. So, um, you know, you're sort of underscoring here that for 14 of the cases, a case of identity, the Priory School, Charles Augustus Milverton, et cetera, um, the Devil's Foot, you know, particular favorite of mine, Thorbridge, the Creeping Man, others. There are no anticipations. So that's an area where Dakin was really um, the first one to put a stake in the ground in many of his observations. That's a very fair point uh, Bert's making, um, that there are a lot of, you know, these stories where I could not find any previously written um, uh, anticipations of them. Uh, and, you know, I, I sort of took it upon as like a personal failure when I couldn't find anything. Um, so I, I kept looking and looking, uh, and but I couldn't find anything. So. Um, yeah, no, that's a very fair point. Now, do you think, uh, Bruce, that um, there are other bits that can be squeezed out? I mean, I think of, um, oh gosh, it's that uh, that Wisteria Lodge uh, interplay between, uh, I think it's Inspector Baines and Sherlock Holmes, where he said, I think, I, just when I thought I squeezed it dry, you come along and there's something more. Do you think there's something more here still, B Bruce? Bruce? Uh, I would absolutely say yes. Um, there always seems to be something more. Um, and, you know, whether it's those 14 stories that I couldn't find anything on or, you know, expanding the search beyond the BSJ and the SHJ, um, there's bound to be something or, you know, just a different angle or take on what's already written uh, or different interpretation. So I would say absolutely there's more to be had here. Well, that's great news, I would imagine. And finally, uh, and, and this is, of course, Bird, unless you have uh, other questions, but my final question uh, really turns back to your, uh, your studies, your early studies, Bruce. You said you had a PhD in social psychology. What, what would or what do social psychologists have to say about people like us who are crazed with this uh, little e-day fix? Uh, I've been out of the field for many, many years. Yeah, it's, it's um, very different than uh, a clinical psychologist. So while definitely steer clear of that, um, it's, you know, social psychologists look at be people's behaviors, group behaviors, really. Um, so I guess you could say the Sherlock Holmes, the people as a group, um, but a, a, it's a healthy hobby. I'll leave it at that. Yes, yes. It's, a, it's, a it's a hallmark, clearly, of people with impeccable taste. There you go. <laughs> well, Bruce Harris, author of Anticipations and D. Martin Dakin's A Sherlock Holmes Commentary, thank you so much for being a, not only an avid listener of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, but a contributor to the literature on the subject. My pleasure, and thank you so much for having me. You know, I wish I knew more about D. Martin Dakin as a person. I did do a little research before we began talking to Bruce, and I found, found virtually nothing. Some people online, of course, and you can trust implicitly any observation that you find online, <laughs> identify Dakin as an American writer. But I doubt that because uh, one of the things I did discover was David Martin Dakin, 
who was born in 1908 and who died in 1979, I believe, was the first winner in the game Brain of Britain in 1954. Oh, how do you like that? I suspect it's the same gent. And the other thing is, he, he wrote another book. He's mostly, well, just completely um, known or um, found online in association with a Sherlock Holmes commentary. But he apparently did write another book, D. Martin Dakin, Peace and Brotherhood in the Old Testament. Well... That's easy for you to say. Um, well, I think his own foreword to the book where he says uh, he hasn't read much scholarship from the other side of the Atlantic is a dead giveaway that he's on the other side of the Atlantic. <laughs> um, and I think we mentioned this when we interviewed Glenn Dakin for uh, his book, uh, The Little Sherlock Holmes Book of Wisdom. Dakin, 2.30, Sherlock Holmes' Little Book of Wisdom. We, met, we asked if he was any relation to T. Martin Dakin. He had no idea. Um, but my recollection from that interaction is we determined Martin Dakin was a, uh, an, an, an academic of sorts, either a school teacher or a professor. Um, and, and this was something that he just kind of did on the side. So, yeah. Well, that makes sense. Wonderful. Wonderful. Sense, yeah. Well, I'm I'm glad he did, and I'm glad Bruce did, and um, you know, what, isn't it wonderful when we have uh, kind of an old standard like this, and now it can be updated, uh, uh, really in the vision of the original author. You know, when he said he didn't know what he didn't know, uh, here along comes Bruce to tell him and all of us what uh, Dakin didn't know. Yeah. So. Well, well, but you know, too, the the lovely thing about it is the premise, you know, the premise of Bruce's book, but also the premise of Dakin's book, which is, you know, start reading and get a pencil and a note <laughs> pad and an index card or something. And as you're reading, you know, make notes about things that don't sound right, things that you're curious about. And after a little while, you've got a volume uh, with your name on it. Yeah. Yeah, more people should read with pencils. Hmm. One of the great Sherlockian periodicals is back. The 2021 Sherlock Holmes Review. Edited by Steve Doyle. Art direction by Mark Gagan. With all new contributions from Nicholas Meyer, Robert Doherty, Frank Cho, Anne Margaret Lewis, Steve Hawkinsmith, Les Klinger, Jimmy Aiken, and more. 118 pages about Sherlock Holmes. The illustrators, community, collecting, comics, reviews, film and TV, scholarship, including new artwork, Irene Adler drawn by the inimitable Frank Cho. It looks like a book and reads like a magazine. It's the Sherlock Holmes Review. Get your first edition copy of this essential 2021 Sherlockian annual, the all-new Sherlock Holmes Review, at wessexpress.com. It's that time once again. It's everyone's favorite Sherlockian quiz show. That's right, it's Canonical Couplet, where we give you two lines of poetry, and we ask you to discern which Sherlock Holmes story it is that we are obliquely referring to. Now, if you were around here the last time around, and I think you were, Bert, um, you will recall that we gave you this clue. It was a tiny treasure, not quite a bean in size. Holmes relied on simple means. It pays to advertise. Bert, <laughs> do you know which yeah. story we're talking about? Yes, I do. That's the story about the villainous contractor who was remodeling a kitchen and never showed up. That's the case Watson called the no good builder. <laughs> Yeah, you get the full trombone treatment this week. No, I am afraid that is incorrect. Oh, no. um, and and as usual, our friend Eric Deckers had uh, his own take on it. 
He said, uh, it's the story of the man who was murdered by being forcibly restrained in his car seat with a powerful industrial adhesive. It's the adventure of the glued car buckle. <laughs> oh, I like that. That's cute. <laughs> Except, uh, Eric says, I don't think they had cars during Holmes's early career. So I think it's more likely the adventure of the blue carbuncle. Well, now we are on to something, Eric. Yes, that is the answer we were looking for, the adventure of the blue carbuncle. We had a number of people who contributed entries this time, so we are going to turn to the big prize wheel and give it a spin. See who the lucky one is this time around. Getting a copy of DC Comics. Uh, and in this case, it is number 27. It looks like 27. And that corresponds to, oh, our friend Charlie Blankstein. Charlie, congratulations. Yes, we will have a copy of that 1975 DC comic to you with Sherlock Holmes on the cover. So that is exciting. And uh, now, this time around, we will have for a prize, well, a copy of Bruce Harris's book, Anticipations in Martin Dakin's A Sherlock Holmes Commentary. So, if you're ready, here you go. Rods and reels and baskets, and an evening bright in May. A daring, desperate man receives a censure for delay. If you know the answer to this episode's canonical couplet, put it in an email address to comment that I hear of Sherlock.com with canonical couplet in the subject line. If your correct answer is among all of the others and we choose you at random, you'll win. Good luck. All right. Well, <laughs> we have done it again. This, Hooray. this, oh, you know, uh, we should have mentioned this at the top of the show, Bert. You know what today is? Why, today is Straw Hat Day. Yes, you knew! I am so glad. <laughs> of Straw Hat Day. Of course. This is, I was up early this morning taking my top hat and my bowler and my fedoras and all of my various felt hats, my berets, you know, all 30 or 40 of them out, of course, <laughs> out of the shelves and putting in uh, my straw hats, you know, my boaters, my Panamas. Yeah. Hmm. It, it, it is that time of the year, no question. And, you know, if uh, folks would like a uh, an audio companion to go along with hats and uh, hat care in the canon, we do have a trifles episode for that. That is our companion show. If you haven't listened to it, we highly recommend it. We will put a link to episode 152 of trifles in the show notes so you can look that up. I don't know if Martin Dakin ever addressed hats in uh, the commentary, but it might be worth uh, looking at. Oh, well, that's a very good question. Certainly uh, the hat in uh, last week's uh, or last episode's quiz answer there, the blue carbuncle, uh, that uh, battered billycock was uh, something worthy of note. Well, I will tell you, I've just opened my copy of Dakin, and he has a large number of references to headgear. Headgear. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, at least eight references, oh, eight perfect. locations, eight things to say about headgear. Excellent. Well, that is worthy of investigation, no question. And commentary. And commentary. Hmm. And we've anticipated him, haven't we? <laughs> so there you are. Very good. Hmm. Well, I suppose this uh, ends the commentary for this particular episode. And uh, until next time, I am the appropriately headgeared Scott Monty. And I'm just the muted Bert Wolder. And together, we say... The, the Games, games of Foot! <laughs> the, the Games of Foot! You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I am neglecting business of importance which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. 
Goodbye and good luck. And believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes. 